Chicago has never left the feudal age, okay? <laughs> the facade looks terrific. That money goes directly to Abu Dhabi. Two to three billion dollars, that's poof, gone. When there's no base rules, then strong leaders develop. What Chicago has, and it's nowhere else in America, it's called... The money's coming in every year there, but going out of the city... Out of the city. ...to Canada. And funding again, their employees' retirement. That bill is coming due. What do you call it when two politicians get together for a meeting in Chicago, Peter? So you could honestly see, hey, we have these beautiful beaches. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah, is Mexico going to own them next summer? Don't make those people hide. Don't make them become more extreme. Don't make them become more violent. It's tied to the very bloodline of how the city has worked since the 1830s when it was founded. Good morning, guys. Here in Chicago, referred to as the most corrupt or one of the most corrupt cities in America, we're meeting up with a First Amendment attorney who knows the city inside and out, grew up here, and is going to show us on the ground examples of corruption taking place here in Chicago. Let's do this. See that dome building that we're looking at? That's okay. the Adler Planetarium. And as you move uh, inland, uh, at some point here, it becomes what used to be Miggs Field. Uh, it was the third airport in Chicago. It's no the, longer. It's the here. airport was right there. Yeah, yeah, right there. Oh, you wow. You can see the stretch of land over to the right between the buildings. It's yep. now Northerly Island. It's all tied to how Chicago operates. How do we know Chicago's corrupt? And it gets kind of squishy looking at the different numbers. One way that we know is um, looking at just some anecdotal evidence. 35 billion with a B in debt. Four very large, oh, you're no fine. No problem. Man. Four large pension funds that go for things like uh, the police and firefighters and, okay. and such. They have $10 billion in assets to cover that 35 billion in debt. If we look at crime, crime is up 20% over the past five years. What kind of crime? Theft and burglary, robberies, these sorts of things. Murders okay. are slightly going, trending downwards. That's happening okay. nationally. You, would, so, you wouldn't know that by looking at the news. You'd think murders were, would be right. up, right? Well, it's, it's sensational, but yeah. data says they're slightly down. But we should be concerned about property crime and the like, and especially sure. with Illinois. In September, it will be switching to cashless bail program, right? So those who've been convicted of a crime will no longer be held uh, unless it can be shown that they're an extreme, you know, risk for flight. Okay. So, uh, so there's a concern about recidivism there and about repeat crime. But um, we have a school system in Chicago that is spending 55% more now on 20% less students. Uh, it has, has been a sort of a grand failure nationally. 20% proficient in English language arts of the students in Chicago, 16% proficient in math. 16 yeah. for Six, the whole city? 16. That's the average. Okay. So spending 50% more, 20% less students, okay. delivering 20% percent and 16 percent. But how can you blame that on corruption? Isn't that a, a whole host of factors? It, it is a host of factors, but if we take these together and we think about what, what does corruption do to a city and what does it do to a people? It removes resources that you would otherwise use in a well-functioning state to be able to deliver services. It's the slowest growing city for two decades. From 20 to 2022, it lost 80,000 people. In the year of 2022, it lost another 100,000 people. They're fleeing the city. Where are they going? Largely going to places like Florida and Texas. Those seem to be two main drivers. So they're leaving the state? They're leaving the state. Because in California, a lot of leaving Los Angeles and San Francisco, a lot are staying within California. Right. No, they're not, they're not staying in Illinois. Um, bro more broadly speaking, beyond Chicago, Illinois has the highest property taxes. Illinois itself is rated as one of the most corrupt states, usually in the top five. So if you're looking to leave Chicago, 
it's not enough just to to head an hour or two out. You you wanna you wanna go somewhere for a fresh, clean start. So what I'm gathering, Ben, is you like corruption. That's why you live <laughs> no, here. Yeah. yeah. yeah you, I, enjoy, I, you enjoy the the, the I, tough love. I, I am north of Chicago, so I, I'm close enough to be able to come in and do my work. But you're in Illinois. I am in Illinois. I, I am. I've got family here, and okay. I want want to take care of them. But uh, and and it's you know it's it's the land of Lincoln. There's a lot that's good in the state of Illinois. I love Midwestern people. I've lived on the East Coast for a good amount of time. It's a very cold sort of uh, soulless place. I love the heart in Chicago. I love the small okay. talk. I love I love the banter. I love the people. But you're dealing with a city that has 50 aldermen. So think of it as 50 mayors with their own feudal little states. What Chicago has, and it's nowhere else in America, it's called aldermanic privilege. Okay. So, if you are this store here, Planta Queen, and you want to add on an addition here that would generally be allowable, and there's a simple zoning uh, variance, your alderman has to sign off on it, and he can say no for no basis in the law and reject it. And, and so your business streams can be, can be shut down. They have considerable authority without any reference to statutory provisions, regulations, to control exactly what's happening here. Now, if you're someone who cares about things like racial equity and some of the issues that we've seen discussed by good folks on the left more recently, Chicago's still a very segregated city with yeah. uh, minorities frequently being on the south side of Chicago mm -hmm. and the north and northwest side of Chicago being predominantly white. On the north and northwest side, 90, about a 90% blockage of low-income, multi-unit, um, affordable housing. So if you want to keep minorities out of an area, you give aldermen that, that sort of power. They've been routinely criticized for this. They promise reform, they promise better things. At the same time, you see about a 90% approval on the south side of Chicago when these sort of projects come up. So there's this sort of subtle form, may maybe of racism, uh, that's built, built into that because, uh, you know, aldermen are given this tremendous power and, and rather than have specifically defined duties and rules and, and roles or professional managers in the city, we've still kept that power. Now, we used to do this. New York used to do this, Boston used to do this, but there were reforms that, were, that occurred in the late 1800s and sure. early 1900s towards a more professional way of managing cities. Chicago has never left the feudal age, okay? <laughs> uh, it, it, you see, that with such uh, conviction. No, it, I mean, it's it, never it's, left the feudal age. It, it's bizarre. So. Now, what they'll tell you, yeah. the aldermen will tell you that this is a great system because I, get, I as an alderman, get to be hands-on. If Topolo Bampo needs help, I can come right on down, I can write something up, and I can get it taken care of. Well, that's true if you're in the good graces with your, with your alderman. Or, okay. as the history suggests in Chicago, if you've paid off, if you've uh, participated in a racketeering scheme, if you've delivered your dues, um, then yeah, you're going to be taken care of. So the mob haven't. exists here in a different way, a more benevolent way, let's say. Right, right. Well, right now we're talking about public corruption, which is those folks holding public office using it for private gain. That's the definition of public corruption. As an outsider, downtown, I see clean streets. Right, right. I see no tents yeah. and no homelessness down here. It's pretty remarkable these days. I agree. No, no. City still run, you know, buses run on time. The city's clean. It, it looks nice. Uh, Chicago could still be so much more. Maybe people wouldn't be fleeing. Maybe it'd be a hub of entrepreneurialism as it was in the late 1800s, early 1900s, if you didn't have, you know, public officials continually skimming off of private operations. Okay, okay but restaurants like these, India House, uh, the many ones we just passed, they seem to be thriving, doing pretty well? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the, it's not so hard that you're, you're closing doors on places? Well, it, it's not today, but when you look at the balance sheet and you consider that there's $35 billion just in pension funds alone that are coming due, $10 billion to cover it, 
Chicago's engaged in a series of sort of short sales of different uh, properties and items to be able to meet their financial responsibilities over the past two decades, mm -hmm. that's going to catch up with the city eventually. Okay, so how do these pensions get paid out if there's so much debt? Well, there's been recent tax increases. Uh, Lightfoot passed uh, another property tax increase. What are your, to, what are your property her. taxes? Oh, they're the highest in the nation. You tax food here. I thought that to be quite crazy. Right. You, there's, I, no, I, there's no escaping the, the, the great tax hand of, of uh, here, Illinois. Can you, can you hold this one yeah, second? Yes, absolutely. Um, I want to show you this. I brought this from the grocery store before I came over. I bought a kombucha, right? Uh, what was it? $4.99, so a steep price, but we're in the city, I get it. There are two taxes on here. One is 3% sales tax, and one is a 25% sales tax. What is that? We get a 3% sales tax. Sales tax. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> so 66 cents on that drink, All right. which kicked it up to 565. That's right. You know, it runs afoul of sort of the, the, the old, you know, thought that we had John Adams, we're a nation of laws who are not a nation of, of men. Chicago is a nation of men. This is the city of Capone, it's the city of Dillinger, it's the city of Daly's. And when you don't have strong rules in place, when you don't have, for example, the city lacks a city charter, which would be the equivalent of a constitution for, for it, when there's mm -hmm. no base rules, then strong leaders develop. And they don't always act in ethical ways. I'm sure that there are, there are many members of the uh, city council who are doing a fine job, who are responsible public servants. Okay. But you, you can't, the numbers don't lie. Uh, Professor Simpson's numbers don't lie. What's happening to the city doesn't lie. And the historic instances of public corruption are, are in their face. One of the more recent indictments that was Alderman Ed Burke, who was, a, I think, the longest serving city council member in recent history in Chicago. He was caught on the south side talking to one of his constituents about getting a variance for the Burger King property there, some sort of expansion. Mm -hmm. And there's a security camera right there. And it captured him telling him, well, you just got to hire my law firm and you pay money into my law firm, X amount, then we're going to make sure this is all taken care of for you. Now this is going to trial. I don't know whether Alderman Burke is guilty or, or, or innocent of right. ultimate charges, but it does suggest that there was likely a shakedown that was that was occurring. So it's a curious thing if you're walking in Chicago, or you're, more importantly, if you're driving and you're looking for a spot to park, you have a pay to park area up here. Okay, and that's typical. What? Yeah, but what isn't typical is what most people don't know is that whenever you pay for parking in Chicago, that money goes directly to Abu Dhabi. Okay, and it never hits the city coffers. Okay, unpack so, that for yes, us. Yes, yes. So again, you were talking about things aren't too bad, they're, they're too, too hard here, the businesses seem to be doing okay. Well, in 2008, Richard Daly, Jr. He, and for those that don't know, Daly, the father, was in office for many years. Yes. Then Jr. took over. Yeah. So he's known well, really well here. Yes, yes, absolutely. So at the end of his term, he decided a good way to make money for Chicago would be to sell or to create a 75-year lease. I believe it was sold to Morgan Stanley, then immediately transferred from Morgan Stanley to Abu Dhabi. And so the proceeds from this uh, will go there. Now, now, there's been studies by the Office of Inspector General and uh, I think another scholarly organization. It was sold, sold at probably a billion dollars less than its market value. And it's probably lost somewhere between two to three billion dollars thus far in revenue that would have gone into the city of Chicago. Okay, so the old mayor sold this to the highest bidder in yes. Abu Dhabi. Yes. So every time I put money or someone puts money in here, that's going out of the city. It's going out of the city. They got their short-term money. For 75 years. 75 years. So, so they, they took a short-term gain to cover debt and problems that they were having that that'll last them okay. for a while and this is this is the game that chicago has been doing and then you sell a little something else and you're going to cover that that debt and things still look city's clean we got we got a, a a cleaner right right here things look like they're going okay but that bill is coming due okay so this this is losing 
uh, somewhere, like I said, right now, two to three billion dollars that's poof, gone. In addition to losing a lot of money, say if you're an environmentalist or you're someone who cares about, you think cycling and pedestrian zones are really important in Chicago. It's not my perspective, but there's reasonable people who advocate for that. Well, they built into this deal negative um, consequences such that you have to pay an absurd amount of money for each parking spot you remove off of the street. Oh, so if you were to turn a block into a pedestrian zone or you were to create a bike lane that goes through a particular neighborhood and you cut off three parking spots, that's a huge amount of money that Chicago has to pay to Abu Dhabi because they're losing revenue. And, and what... How short-sighted is that? And then, you know, the interesting tale on that story, too, is that Richard Daly, after leaving office, uh, joined the law firm that brokered the deal. Now, that, that in and of itself is not uh, any sort of official corruption. It's, it's a little suspicious, though, to, to broker such a big deal that sh where Chicago loses it, and then to go to the firm that, you know, negotiated that deal. You know what would be the ultimate twist of the knife is that money going into Abu, da Abu Dhabi goes into their pension fund for their city. Please right. tell me it doesn't. No, right. I, don't, yeah, I, don't, haven't, I haven't tracked the numbers that far. I can't, can't tell you. <laughs> All right. And so your wife in the back here. Yes, Shauna is Shauna. in the back. She's helping out. She, she, she reached out to you about yeah. the story, and she is my best PR agent. Shauna, what do you think of this craziness in Chicago? I grew up in D.C., and there's its own little bank of corruption there, but this is on a whole other level of, like, you just don't know how it's working and how it's stayed this way for so long. So we're at Northerly Island. This used to be Chicago's third airport called Miggs Field. And on the end of March, I think it was maybe March 30th, 2003, 20 years ago, Richard Daly Jr., who after years of despising this field, having battles with legislators in Springfield, the Illinois capital, and with the federal FAA, uh -huh. showed up at midnight with trucks, construction trucks, went, damaged all of the lanes so that planes could not take off and declared it the end of MIG's field. He put, um, he went over, there was a webcam at Adler uh, Planetarium he put a fire truck and some uh, flares out so no, so the public couldn't see what was happening. Uh, and it's rumored that they said, you know, when they asked him, they said, but you don't have legal authority to do this. It's rumored that his mm -hmm. answer was, but I am the law. It's everything Chicago was since the, the, the 1830s. And, and at the beginning, it was Republicans who ran the city. So Governor, Tom, or I'm sorry, Mayor Thompson was the last Republican mayor of Chicago. That ended in the early 1930s. He set up war districts. He set up precinct clubs. He set up the whole system of where, how bribes go back and forth between interested contractors who want to do business with the city uh, and, and how that exactly works. So they call it, uh, you know, the term was deemed racketeering back in the 20s. That was a union mob machine sort of definition. That is mm -hmm. to set up a fake service, usually connected to government, that doesn't need to be done so you can extract money from, from government to be able to benefit yourself. And, you know, this isn't just something that, for example, Governor Thompson did in the 1930s. He, he was friends with Al Capone. He was a character. His friends received uh, property taxes that were 1% of their assessed value. Enemies of the machine at that time received property taxes that were up to 100% of the, of the value of, of their property. They, they had wide-scale control uh, over this. Now, now, we think, surely this kind of thing can't happen today, but you know, one, of the, uh, one of the corruption angles that came out of the uh, daily administration was the hire a truck program. So the hire a truck program was essentially friends of the daily administration, friends of the family, who had trucks that they wanted to 
rent out and do city business mm -hmm. who weren't actually being used. Uh, so it was a, it was a payoff uh, for other contributions and work these groups had done to the tunes of tens of millions of dollars. It looks like they did little to no work for the city of Chicago. Maybe the city, it looks like it's doing well. I mean, you have, look at this, you have this, you have the museums, you have the big buildings, you have a, a very robust economy here. Maybe the place can just absorb it all. To it's, a point. It, it's to absorbed point. it, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. okay, you're, say, working class person making, I don't know, what, 50, 60 grand yeah. here? Right. How are they seeing any of this affect them? Well, you see property taxes that are out of control. That so they're no renting. Reason. Let's say they're renting. Well, of course, that's passed on from the landowner to, to, to a renter. Okay. That's going to increase costs there. Um, the ability in Chicago to be able to set up a new business, it's not like any other city. So if you're in New York, you have a standardized set of forms that you're going to rent this building, enter into a lease, you have this permit, X, Y, and Z. In Chicago, you can have all of that, and if the alderman says no, okay, you're done. And that's absurd. That's, that's a relic of the late 1800s, early 1900s, where we were bonded more by religion or ethnicity and not by just some, some commonality. And it's, it's tiring because if you talk about corruption in Chicago, you get the repeated refrain of, well, it's a, that's just what Chicago is and, and, and the like. But, you know, it, it's like what Justice Scalia used to say about, uh, that, about free speech. It's, you, know, you look at the Soviet Constitution, you want to see a promise of free speech there, and it, it's great and it's glamorous and it offers so much more protection than what the American Bill of Rights protects. But it was a piece of paper. It, the people of Chicago have to want clean government. They have to want an elimination of the bloat. They have to want a, a professional and responsibly managed so city. So who doesn't want that? I, I think it, I think you get lost in it day, day by day. You're it's living just, your life. It's just so complicated to yeah. alderman, mayor. Yeah. I don't know. I don't you're, see you're, it you're necessarily. Living, you're living your life. That you know. Look at the, there's yeah. happy, there's happy people da down at the beach. There's somebody out in, out in a rowboat having a good time. They've put in their 40, 80 hours. They don't have time to necessarily delve in, into all this. It looks like it's going okay, but as I've gone over on the numbers, they're staggering. All right, this is a city that's tilting with some serious financial consequences. And what, what do they sell off next? Do they sell the beaches off? Do they pay you to breathe the air in the city? What, what, yeah, okay, you, you, we, we can keep doing this for so long, but it's not, it's not responsible for, yes, so the facade looks terrific. It, lo it looks yeah. great, but it's I mean, gonna, the bill collector is, the bill's coming due. The bill collectors will show up. In so Chicago, why, we'll why, why do you want to talk about this? Is it because you just want to wake people up to the situation here, or what, what's what's your what's your stake? In I, it, let's I mean, say. I, I I hate corruption and and, and injustice, and yeah. I think talking about it and trying to make it as clear and easy to understand is a benefit to the American people. And 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 I don't care whether you're a Chicagoan who's a, a deep union guy, or you're an environmentalist or you're a gun owner guy in the right, I think everybody should, should care about this. I mentioned the bike, the bike paths and the Abu Dhabi deal. Environmentalists should care about that. That's destroying their ability. And people on the right who are traditionally concerned about fiscal responsibility should care about this as well. So Chicago just, it keeps running out of money or getting on the brink of financial insolvency. It's gone through several periods where it's uh, credit rating has gone to junk rating by, by credit scoring agencies. Uh, so then it hurries up and figures out a way to, to either increase taxes or sell something off just to stay, stay safe for the next couple of years. So the next iteration of this in the game is the Chicago Skyway. Chicago Skyway is a toll road that connects if you're coming in from Indiana okay. uh, into the city. It's nice and beautiful and it allows you to quickly get into the city. Um, now when Chicago had financial difficulties, again, during the Daley administration, they decided that a, I'm trying to remember whether it's a hundred year lease, something like a very long lease of, the, of that would be appropriate. So the Canadian Pension Fund bought the Chicago Skyway. Again, it was a situation where it was seriously undervalued once the office of the inspector general looked at it afterward. Again, rules are important, right? So if we had a healthy functioning city, 
you would have an audit process ahead of time. The Office of Inspector General might analyze the financial propriety of a deal, and people would have to sign off on it before an asset's released. N none of that occurred, right? It's just simply the mayor moving forward, setting, setting a deal. So when that goes to the Canadian Pension Fund, the money's coming in every year there, but going out of the city, out of the city. to Canada. Yeah. And, and funding again, their employees' retirement? Fun funding that. Now, now it just changed. So uh, a firm in Australia bought a majority interest, something like 75% interest in the Skyway. So now the money's flowing to Australia. So you could honestly see, hey, we have these beautiful beaches. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah, is Mexico going to own them next summer? And, and there are going to be toll beaches, and you come up here, and you, you put your credit card in, and the money goes to Mexico? Maybe. Part of the reason why Chicago became such a, a hub for corruption that it brought hustlers, it brought people wanting to do deals in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And that's a good thing, but with that, you, you need to hold them to a level of accountability. And why, why hasn't the city taken those basic steps in the, the past 150 years? So it has, it has a hustler origin story, sort of like Miami. Yes, and, and that brings it, you know, I love entrepreneurs. I love I love creators, um, but they sometimes operate outside the box. And you need to have some basic rules in in place that benefits everybody. We got an interesting shot going on up here. Yeah, what's going on here? I don't know. It's really an impressive place. My first time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, my uh, my mom's dad, my maternal grandfather worked for the Northwestern Railroad. So he was an engineer, he shoveled coal, uh, had big, big muscles. Uh, so he, he day in, day out did that. And on my father's side, uh, my paternal grandfather ran a glass shop. He was a glazier and uh, he had to fight with the union and um, probably organized crime here and there in his, his career because he was a non-union shop. And Okay, so with crime, Statistically, there are worse times. You walk around the center of the city or here, yeah. and it seems very safe. What, what are your thoughts on crime? It's hard to gauge. I mean, so many people told me, don't come to Chicago. Well, right? I think there are certain like... parts of Chicago. That, that most major cities do a similar approach. Wherever it's beautiful and, and pretty, you make sure you got a good police presence, and you want to make sure that, that's safe. If we go to the south side of the city, it's going to be uh, a little bit different, a little sketch here. <laughs> Those guys all turned around. <laughs> and uh, you have issues that are going on. For, so for example, Chicago's used a thing called the spot shotter for the past decade or so. It's a series What's of that? microphones that they put in different neighborhoods. Okay. And if a gunshot goes off, it can use its algorithms to track down its origin very quickly. And then the police can get there in fairly rapid amount of time. Um, it's not perfect, right? So, so some civil rights advocates have said, you're putting this in usually minority neighborhoods and that's unfairly targeting them. You have government microphones out on streets capable of listening in. That, that's a, a potential issue. Around here? Um, no, I, I think you'd find them mostly in the south side of Oh, so Chicago. they're listening in. Well, they say, the, the, the company will tell you that they're only activated once a gunshot's been um, you know, noticed by it. So uh, it, there's some tension going on about, about that issue. And, and so, yeah. so it's not a perfect net technology, but it certainly allows folks to get more quickly to the scene of a crime and be able to shut it down and catch those who are responsible. We have cashless bail starting in September in, in Illinois. So you'll, uh, you'll be, if you're con arrested for a crime, uh, you'll be free to walk and uh, not have to pay bail unless it can be shown you're in extreme flight risk. So when people pay bail, they have skin in the game a little bit. Right, that's the idea. Isn't that the whole yeah. point? And on the other, the newer thinking on it, I think from people who are concerned about things like equity and such, or that uh, marginalized communities don't have access to as much capital and that imprisons them where middle class and upper class people are going to be able to, to, to get out. It's not, it's not a... Uh, unreasonable argument, but I think a wholly cashless bail system is probably dangerous, probably a, a step towards lawlessness and encouragement of crime. Uh, I think there's probably a median point there, but uh, we'll, we'll find out real soon. Well, we 
are approaching 41st and Pulaski. This is the site where allegedly Alderman Ed Burke did a shakedown. You'll note on the light up there is yep. a security camera. Okay. And from what I've learned from reports, he just wasn't wise enough to realize you probably shouldn't stand out on the sidewalk and talk by a security camera. As I, what my understanding is it picked up part of that alleged shakedown. Those pick up audio? Right, audio and video. And it's just one more example. Like I said, 37 aldermen have been convicted, at least since the 1970s in Chicago for shakedown, racketeering, uh, tax fraud, wire fraud, mail fraud. These are the popular array of things. You don't set up a system and say, we hope we get really good guys yeah. and we're gonna give them tens of millions of dollars and we just hope they do good stuff with that. So this That's is close to, you're a First Amendment lawyer, attorney, so this is very close to your heart. Well, transparency, right? Yeah. So uh, the ability to shine light into the operation of government, those who hold power over the governed, is crucial to a healthy democracy. It's the lifeblood of a democracy. So um, I, I think the instance of that camera there in particular capturing this is, is, is good stuff. We're gonna go on to another site and talk about how citizens can do more of this and oh, really? expose that. Okay. So that'll, that'll be our next stop. Uh, but no, yeah, that, that, I, I think a vibrant exercise of First Amendment rights is one of the best ways that you cure corruption. And citizens, like if you look at what's going on right now with parents getting engaged in school board controversial discussions about okay. curriculum and per potentially secret agendas going on there, transforming what their children are learning, that's a, that's a good thing. They need to participate. And the yeah. citizens of Chicago, I think, have a right to say, that they expect better out of their aldermen and that they expect some firm rules to be in place. So first is an awareness of the problem. Secondly, as a citizen, I feel pretty powerless. Like, one vote doesn't mean anything, it's cliche saying, but like, what, what are you really gonna do? Right, right, well, I, I mean- and you're just saying vote, vote for whomever has the policies with less corruption. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I imagine that you know, it's not the whole slate of aldermen that are hoping to expand aldermanic privilege. Uh, vote for folks and work with folks that want to reduce that. Work with people who want to put a charter. It, you know, if, if I told you I was running a business and, and we had no bylaws, we're just, we're trusting Ben's good judgment and I'd like $50 million from you and, and there are no consequences if I squander that money or yep. do bad things. I'm just a good guy, I'm gonna do well. I, okay. I get laughed out of a boardroom. Same thing's going on in Chicago. Okay, but last time I voted in uh, county elections, let's say, uh, you know, who was up for, for vote? A lot of people, actually. And I, and I don't know, it's hard to vet. Yes. I tried yeah. to vet and understand who was who and their positions. Yeah. Let's say I put an hour into it, max. And that's more than most, I think, are doing. That's the most I've ever put into it. Right. And it's so hard to find whose uh, track record is clean and whose isn't. So it's, I mean, who's who's voting on Alderman? Yeah, anybody. Yeah. Right. So, so vote for the guy who hasn't been indicted. I guess would, would, that's would, the starting would point. Be the, okay. Would be your first your first criteria. Uh, you know, in mo most major cities, you have taxpayer alliances and, and other groups that will lean slight left or slight right, that's not particularly important, but you can get information from them about voting records and about how reform-oriented uh, aldermen are. And so relying on those sorts of resources helps average citizens to be able to do that. Um, you know, we just, we don't want the situation. There's an old joke in Chicago. What, what, what do you call it when two politicians get together for a meeting in Chicago, Peter? Uh, citizens getting screwed? A out crime of money. scene. <laughs> We are headed to Rehan Pub, and in the late 70s, it was known as the Mirage Tavern. The Chicago Sun-Times and a nonprofit actually purchased the pub, and they mic'd it up and wired it up 
so that they could capture government officials coming in, brokering illegal deals. The results of this were that a third of the electrical inspectors in Chicago were indicted on corruption charges, because whenever you wanted something done to your electrics, they would add on additional fee for themselves, or you wouldn't be able to get that work done. So it was quite, quite an interesting uh, time for journalism. It was also highly criticized because it's unseemly and dirty and you, you actually you know, entrap people in an area and you captured their close and intimate discussions. But it led to public good, right? So it exposed corruption. Um, there were a lot of tax reform initiatives that were passed in Chicago at the time. Mm -hmm. There were improvements made to uh, this sort of government services to make sure that not as many bribes and not as much racketeering was occurring it wasn't perfect reform, but at least was a step forward. And I think that's I think it's a great thing that citizens and journalists can do uh, by exposing this and showing to the public the truth of what's happening. So are journalists still doing that here? Here, I can't think of any regular undercover operations. But this is Brehan Pub, so I thought it'd be fun to go in. Do you want to get a bite to eat? Yeah, yeah. Let's yeah, do let's it. have dinner. Yeah. Staple and, of the uh, community, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I know I mentioned it earlier, but I'm actually very impressed with Chicago's streets downtown here. Like, leaps and bounds above most cities in the U.S. right now that I've seen So recently. they're doing that right? They're doing it right. I mean, if you eat like this in many parts of San Francisco, right, it's someone's overrun. coming to the table. It's... When I was at the cafe while you guys were filming the park, yeah. there was actually a couple of homeless guys going and really beating down some of the guys sitting outside. Several times the same guy came by asking the same guy for money. They saw that, like, finally the guy gave up, gave him a dollar, and he's like, there's a five dollar bill in there. And he was like hassling for it. Finally, he walked off. But, right. And it was funny, he walked back again later, and he has this handful of like 20 single dollar bills. So he's hitting them up pretty well. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. But I've also seen zero police officers down here. The last time we came down to downtown, it was just totally filled with cops on every city block. And we, that was right after all of the, um, you know, break-ins where people were... In Magnificent like, Mile, Mile, we were down there to do some shopping and looking around on the weekend. And uh, it was almost like a barricade of, yeah. must have been over a hundred police um, just ready because they, the stores had been hit. So that's what everyone's seeing on the news. Right. Right. And those, that's exceptional times, you know, we're not seeing any of that right now, but it'd be unfortunate if you're sitting here during one of those exceptional times and a mob of violent people come running through. Right. It does happen. Ben, what's going on here? You seem committed. <laughs> it seems serious. We got a Guinness too. We're at an Irish pub. Got to give it a go. French dip. French dip. Classic guacamole bacon. Hamburger. Irish are known for that. Irish are known for that. Food in Chicago overall, it's got a pretty good reputation, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I enjoy it quite a bit. From the deep dish to what's our Japanese restaurant? The, Yukaku. The Yukaku. Better stuff, you know, is when you get out of the main city and like, you know, the things like on the outskirts. Like Persian restaurants we've found that you can't really find in the suburbs. Yeah, yeah this, I think this is, this is an exciting place to be. It's a historic in my mind, a historic monument in Illinois and Chicago that doesn't get enough attention. It's, it's a tribute to citizen journalism, to exposing wrongdoing in government, and showing that real reform can be had. Sometimes got a lot of criticism for doing it. I think there's a lot of space for more citizen work, think tank work, journalist work, of going in and exposing wrongdoing. And that kind of work at the center of the First Amendment, it, it does such a great thing for democracy. So That's what keeps you ticking. Like it was keeps me ticking, and boy, it's, it's so, I'm so happy to have a dinner here. That's cool. Wow, yeah. you, you really feel the historical connection. I do, that. I do. So do you think we're, um, we're lacking this sort of accountability in the media towards these, uh, let's call them nefarious, corrupt actors? There's yeah, just less yeah. of it. And yep. Wait, you were saying off camera, um, this is a good point to bring up, uh, investigative journalism went away. It's not what it was because of the lawsuits, right? It's yeah. really hard to do. Yeah. 
It's, it's tough to do. There's a lot of uh, litigation that gets connected to it. So what is a, you know invasion of privacy? What's a truly private moment that you capture? What, what isn't? Recording laws, these, these sorts of things. Intentional infliction of emotional distress. There's lots of torts available that, that can happen. You can be dragged through litigation for years and win. You still have to pay attorneys like me to be able to do so. And that, that adds onto, onto you know, a budget. But um, no, if, if, you're not, if you're not going in with an eye that's suspicious of those in power, all you're doing is reporting you're a puppet for, for the machine. You're reporting what the powers that be want you to say to the public. That, that's not doing it any good. Real journalism captures the truth. It seeks that out. And it has to do so in elusive and deceptive ways, like the Sun-Times knew when they set up this bar to be able to capture wrongdoing. We need more of that in America. And we need it to focus both on Republicans and Democrats. There's equal blame to be had. So from a legal standpoint, say there was a, an official in there. I came in, I, I concealed the microphone. He couldn't see the camera. Let's just play pretend he couldn't see it. Am I legally allowed to do that? This is a public space. Right. So today, Illinois has what's called all party consent, which means if, you're, if you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in your conversation, then it can't be recorded. But if certainly if we're sitting out here, passerby is coming by, people can hear us, that's not a private conversation. If you're in a busy bar and it looks like there's people within earshot, they can overhear what you're saying, that wouldn't be deemed private. If you go to a back booth and it's not very busy and you're whispering, that's probably a private conversation. It can't be recorded. So there's some wiggle room in the law with that. A lot of, a lot of wiggle room. And it depends on the state. Yes. There's a what middle. would be the most restricted and what's the most open state as far as yeah. this type Ma of journalism? Massachusetts prohibits all secret recording, except for the police. But there's a court case I was involved with there, so you're allowed to record the police secretly. Uh, besides that, nothing else. So very restricted, draconian. Um, we just, my firm just knocked down Oregon's all consent law. So that used to be very restrictive, probably the second most restrictive. Now you can record anything you want there. Um, I, don't think, I don't think Vermont has any recording law in place. And there's 37 other states that have what's called single party consent. So, so long as I'm talking to you, uh -huh. I can record it. And you don't have to tell me. I don't have to tell you. And that's based on, I think, a common sense notion that whatever you expose to someone in public isn't a private conversation. It's not a matter of a private detail. But if you came into my house, we're, we're hanging out like friends, but I don't know you're recording me. What's in that? single party consent states, most of them would still say that's OK. You're still divulging information to another person. That person could go and report it in many different ways. They could say, "This I just had a conversation with Peter. He said the craziest things, and I, yep. I want to tell you. And it's really important <clears throat> that you can do it through electronic digital recording because it's the most accurate way to preserve what really happened. If I say, Peter Zandanello was an anti-Semite. He said all these awful, awful things. Mm -hmm. well, people probably aren't going to believe me. But if I show evidence that you were saying awful things on video, that brings a level of credibility to it, or, or audio, um, to the American public. Of course, you wouldn't say those things. I'll, Sorry, I'll my, my, direct my them towards my Hasidic Jew series. Yes, yes, right, right. <laughs> but, but you get the point, right? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the most accurate way to do that. So I do litigation on this. This is one of my hobbies, one of my passions. And the First Amendment needs to catch up to the technology that we have today, whether it's a GoPro like you're using, whether it's a button cam, whether it's my, my iPhone, the most accurate way that we can preserve a, you know, a detail of events, or yep. wrongdoing, something of public newsworthiness, it's in our hands. Do you feel like there are serious challenges to the First Amendment right now? Or do you think it's very, uh, the, the Constitution is very robust, I mean, it's rock solid, we're, we're good? I, we think just... we have, I think we have a good, you know, speaking, I, I, most of my litigation's in federal court. I think we have very good, um, federal judges. I've been treated fairly in all of those cases. It moves a little slower than I'd like, but that's, that's the justice system. Um, I think my concern is more with the cultural depreciation of values for the First Amendment. 
where colleges, high school students, etc., are going with their views about less about the ability of everyone to be able to speak and focusing more on more modern theories about equity or the rights of marginalized people, which, which I support too. Uh, I, I just think they're co-equal to everyone else. We need to support everyone's right to speak. That's why the ACLU is there, right? That's why they have existed. It was the ACLU who protected the right of neo-Nazis to march just down the road in Skokie, Illinois. Oh, wow. And uh, today there is a menorah in the center of Skokie. You let bad ideas out into, into light. You let bad ideas, ignorant ideas to be exposed. And, and we think that good ideas are going to win out. Um, don't, don't make those people hide. Don't make them become more extreme. Don't make them become more violent. Let them speak and, and let the marketplace of ideas work things out. And it's going to be tumultuous. It's going to be dirty. It's going to be ugly. It's going to feel bad right. in the moment. But long term, the history, like MLK said, Martin Luther King, the arc of the universe bends towards justice. And it's that arc that we have to focus on. Thank you.